chapter 8. You thought we'd never get through chapter 7, but we really haven't because if you read the first several verses of this chapter, it's really chapter 7. Remember, the, the chapter breaks are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Men made the divisions and the verse numbers. and So when you read chapter 7 and then you go into 8, 1 and following, you're seeing basically the same subject. Then along the way in this chapter, it'll move into the new covenant, a better covenant that Jesus is the mediator of. And so we're going to start a study of the new covenant uh, coming up, looks like next week. So Hebrews uh, chapter 8. So this is a continuation of chapter 7 and the teaching on the superior priesthood of Jesus Christ, the high priest in the manner of Melchizedek. So let's pray and then uh, we'll just read the section and then come back verse by verse. Father in heaven, we thank you again for bringing us here to study the book of Hebrews. Lord, it's a complex book for us, but one with great reward as it speaks of the supremacy of Christ above all things and also gives us practical warnings in the spiritual life uh, tempered all through this book. So, Lord, we thank you. We know it's God-breathed and profitable, and so we know every word of it is important to us. So may we concentrate on this carefully by the power of the Spirit that indwells us. And may we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, being not just hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, let's just read 8.1, and let's go down to verse 5. Because you'll start transitioning to the new covenant, and I don't want to get into that too much uh, tonight, but let's look at 8 1. <clears throat> now, the main point and what has been said is this. See, all that's from chapter 7. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also had to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. Well, we really needed chapter 7 to really understand where we're going here, so most of you have been here through that. So now we're continuing that argument from chapter 7 into chapter 8. So let's go back to verse 1 and try to work through what this is talking about. So after being at the end of chapter 6, remember at the end of chapter 6, doesn't it mention Melchizedek? Christ in the manner of Melchizedek. Chapter 7 develops that, the superior priesthood of Jesus in the manner of Melchizedek versus or as opposed to the Levitical priests under the law. So he goes all the way through chapter 7 with this amazing argument. And then he says the main point and what has been said is this. We have such a high priest, the subject of chapter 7, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Also, Christ is called a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. So verse 1 ties back to that previous section and is making a main point about Jesus, our high priest in the order or manner of Melchizedek, who is seated at the right hand of God. So verse 1 says that Jesus is on a throne at the right hand of God. Now, a big question in theology is what throne is this? And there's two main options. You can say this is David's throne, which is definitely Old Testament, or it's the Father's throne. I believe that Jesus is on the Father's throne right now not on David's throne. I don't think they're the same. Some will try to say that. I don't hold that. I think the throne of the Father is in heaven. The Davidic throne is on earth. 
So a passage where Jesus is at the right hand of God and on the Father's throne is Revelation 3.21. Revelation 3.21 says, He who overcomes, I'll grant him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. I think they're two different thrones. Um, The throne of David will come at the second advent when he rules on earth. Right now, he's at the right hand of the Father on the Father's throne. Um, There's a big debate on that, and we've gone over that quite a bit in in, uh, times past in other studies. So one day, Jesus Christ will be seated on the Davidic throne when he returns to this earth to rule the kingdom of God. Uh, And if you go through the scripture, every time you see the throne of David, it's always on earth. Even after David left this earth, who sat on that throne? Solomon, and it's on earth. And I think that's one of the best arguments that the Davidic throne is not in heaven in some spiritual sense. It, uh, it was offered to Israel at the first advent, and then he offered the kingdom. Jews said no to that, so now the kingdom will be postponed. It's not in place now. The millennium will come later after the seven-year tribulation, and then Jesus will physically sit on the throne of David and according to Zechariah 6, 11 through 13, the office of priest and king will then be united when Jesus does that. So God promised David in the Davidic covenant. You remember the Davidic covenant? Don't make me redo that already. 2 Samuel 7, 1 Chronicles 17. The Davidic covenant promised David an eternal seed, an eternal throne, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal dynasty. Uh, And one would be the ruler over all of that, which would be Jesus Christ, the seed. So one day Jesus will come to this earth and sit on the Davidic throne. Isaiah 9, 7. There will be no increase to the increase, sorry, no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom. So the kingdom and the Davidic throne go together to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So Isaiah 9, 6 says a son, a child uh, is born, a son is given. And then this son was born to rule. He came to die, then he would go to the cross before the crown. He would eventually rule on David's throne in the future. Now Isaiah 9, 7 doesn't specifically say on earth. But when Jesus came to this earth, wasn't he offering the kingdom? And the kingdom would be the throne of David from the um, Davidic covenant. So after Jesus' rejection, the pinnacle of that being in Matthew 12, remember they called him the devil basically for casting out the demon out of the demon-possessed man, Um, the kingdom's postponed now. And he does make a comment, uh, many comments about the kingdom along the way that it's simply postponed. It's still coming. Um, go to Matthew nineteen twenty eight. He says something after his major rejection in chapter 12, but before his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's located in the story with the rich young ruler. Everybody in Matthew 19, 28. Remember, Peter had said, we've left everything to follow you. What's in it for us? Jesus said to them, so this would be the apostles, right? Truly, truly, I say to you that you who have followed me. So following Jesus would be what doctrine? What teaching is that? Discipleship. You know what a disciple is? Mathetes in Greek means a follower. A follower of a student. You're a student or a follower of your teacher. So who's the teacher? Christ. And so he's saying, you who have followed me, so these are believers who have followed him in discipleship, in the regeneration... Do you have a comma after regeneration? There should and The Greek doesn't have a comma, but that's how it should be understood, I think. What's the regeneration? 
when God restores all things to Israel in the kingdom. So in the regeneration, that's Israel restored in the land. And notice it even adds something to this. When the Son of Man will be seated on His glorious throne. Notice the when. So that's in the kingdom in the regeneration. Are you following this? So it's still future. The Son of Man comes out of Daniel 7. He's the one that gets a kingdom from the Father. What throne is that? That's the Davidic throne. He's on the Father's throne now. He wasn't yet. Now he is, and now he'll be on the Davidic throne later. So when he returns to this earth to restore Israel and their promised land in the regeneration... See, the Jews understood the regeneration as the kingdom and all things made new. Then he says, you will sit on 12 thrones. So it can't be of more than 12, right? If you think you're going to get to do this, you're wrong. Now, we know Judas Iscariot died, right? He, he committed suicide, but we know from Acts 1 that Matthias was replaced, replaced him. Some argue that Paul was the 13th apostle because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. A really interesting argument. But it's not going to be the church doing this. This, These are the Jewish apostles that will sit on those 12 thrones. And guess what they get to do as Jews? Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what's in it for you, Peter, and you guys? That's pretty neat. (laughs) So this is an earthly kingdom. Remember Matthew 6, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, finish that, on earth as it is in heaven. They're looking for an earthly kingdom, an earthly throne, an earthly Messiah to rule in the earthly location of the promised land. Very physical, uh, very earthly, but yet spiritual subjects who are born again in that kingdom. So in Hebrews 8, 2, Jesus is also referred to as a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, a tabernacle which the Lord pitched, not man. Pitching there is like pitching a tent. What was the tabernacle? It was a movable tent in the wilderness. Remember, they set it up, and then when the Lord moved, the whole camp had to move. So do you have the word minister? Jesus is a minister in the sanctuary, it's the, uh, there's other words for minister. Um, this is a liturgos. A liturgos is a minister or a servant. Uh, it's used of Paul, the apostle. But sometimes this word is used for the Levitical priests, which is in context, uh, I think is the meaning here because of context. Uh, go ahead to jump a little bit ahead to Hebrews 10.11. I'll show you where the same word is used as a verb for the high, for the uh, the Levitical priests of the Old Testament under the law. Hebrews ten eleven says every priest stands daily doing what ministering. There's the verb form and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So the Levitical sacrifices were temporary waiting for the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus who would ultimately and finally take away sin, which we already have now. So Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father performing his high priestly ministry in our behalf, making intercession for us. You know, everyone says, I want a ministry. What's your ministry? Well, what's Jesus' ministry? He has one right now at the right hand of God making intercession for us. So verse 2 says it's a ministry in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. Well, make no mistake, the, the tabernacle erected in the wilderness that this refers to in the time of Moses, after the Jews left Egypt... Was it real and true? It was real. (laughs) That's not saying this is some fake story in the Old Testament. But the writer's making a comparison between the tabernacle on earth versus the true tabernacle in heaven. The one on earth was built by man. But isn't that a copy of the one in the throne room of God? 
you would never know there's a tabernacle in heaven, would you? Or a temple, if the Scripture had not revealed it. And we heard in the Scripture that they built a tabernacle. You can see a, a photo, a drawing of what that looked like. It had that outer perimeter, and you'd enter through those first, that first gate. And what do you see there with the smoke coming up? The brazen altar where the priest would burn the sacrifice. Right behind that is a laver full of water, a bronze laver. The priest had to wash in that before he went into the tabernacle. And according to Exodus, if he didn't wash in that laver to symbolize the cleansing before approaching a holy God in that tabernacle, it says he would die. God would strike him dead. So he would go into that first curtain in that tabernacle, and then there's another veil in there, right, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. And in the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And you can see in the picture the little fire coming down. Uh, that's symbolic of the Lord coming down to dwell in the back of that tent in the Holy of Holies. And the high priest, only one day a year could go back there. And what day was that? The Day of Atonement. Uh, you can see this in Leviticus 16. The Day of Atonement was in the seventh month of the year on the 10th, Yom Kippur. And he had to have blood, and he is the only one that could go behind that veil. And that's going to be important as I show you something at the end of this lesson. So there was the tabernacle, and it was a movable tent. So the Lord would, remember, he was the fire by night and the cloud by day. And when he moved, everybody had to go. Could you imagine moving a campsite of two million people and their tents all at one time? I always joke, I've told you that when we went camping at Lake Travis when we were in high school, just to get two tents up when a storm was coming was like pulling teeth. Imagine the, the organization to move that many people by tribe because they all had to be exactly where the 12 tribes were to be camped with a tabernacle in the middle and they would follow the Lord until it was time to stop again. So the earthly tabernacle made by Moses was simply a copy of the tabernacle that already existed in heaven. More on that in a minute. Well, now and then a little bit later. Go to Hebrews 9.24. The earthly tabernacle was a pattern of the heavenly tabernacle. Hebrews 9.24 says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands. See? The one on earth was made with hands. And then he calls it a mere copy of the true one, the one in heaven. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So after his death, burial, and resurrection, he ascended to heaven. He's now in the throne room of God, seated at the right hand of God, making intercession for us in the heavenly tabernacle. That's, that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. So verse 3, I want to come back to something on that in a minute. So the argument continues because he says 4. He's going to continue to explain. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it's necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Who's this high priest? Christ. So every high priest, that's the Levitical order, is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices in behalf of the people. And since Jesus is a high priest, as we've keep, we just keep reading over and over, he must have something to offer as well. By the way, this will be a major subject of Hebrews 9.11 all the way through chapter 10, verse 10. But I still want to develop this a little bit tonight. So according to verse 3, the priests were required to offer gifts and offerings in behalf of the Israelites. And if Jesus is a high priest, and we know he is, then he must have something to offer too. So what did Jesus have to offer? Himself. It was his own sacrifice of himself on the cross. So if you go forward into the section that I said this is developed... Hebrews 9.14, and I'm picking verses that he did it himself. 
We know the Father offered him, but Jesus did it willingly as well. Hebrews 9.14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So what were the offerings in the Old Testament? What did they have to be? Perfect or without blemish. Remember that Hebrew word tamim, something perfect without blemish. The animals could have no defect whatsoever. They couldn't use them. They were, un, they were disqualified. So if Jesus is without blemish, that means he's without sin. And this is picked up in First Peter as well. So Jesus was the sinless son of God who offered himself voluntarily on the cross. Uh, this is also picked up in Philippians 2.8 about Jesus who voluntarily did this. Awesome passage, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. You can prove the deity of Christ, that he also became flesh, the hypostatic union. And what did he do when he became flesh as eternal God? It says in verse 8, being found in the appearance as a man. Well, if you read earlier, he was eternally God. Remember the word became flesh, John 1. So being found in the appearance as a man, because he was true humanity, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. So Jesus humbling himself indicates that he voluntarily offered himself for our sins. And by the way, do you have the word himself? Uh, that's a reflexive pronoun in the Greek. You did it yourself. You chose to do that. Notice it doesn't say he did it because he had to. Or he was forced to. Um, I love this because this shows how much Jesus must love us and must want us to be with him. And same with the Father. If he was willing to give his own son and Jesus was willing to offer himself, he must want us in his presence for eternity pretty bad. And this one offering of himself was a one-time offering. I'd be impressed if you remember this. What was the word for once? I told you more than once. Remember the word hapax? When we were back in chapter 6, we looked at that word. We did like probably a sermon on that. Um, this word hapax does not mean when it says once for all in your Bible. It doesn't mean once for all people. It means once for all time never to be repeated. Some people say he died once for all, one time for all people. That's not what this word means. I think he did that, but this word means one time only, and he's not going to repeat this sacrifice. Um, so here's a couple of passages, kind of breaking in in the middle of 920, or chapter 9, but in verse 25, nor was it that he, Jesus, would offer himself voluntarily often. By the way, who did that often? Who offered sacrifices often? The priests did it all the time. They never sat down. Jesus would offer himself once, and once <clears throat> he does that, it would never be repeated again because why, why would it not need to be repeated? It's perfect. It's finished. How can you add to perfection? And he died for all sins and all men. He doesn't need to do that again. So nor was it that he would offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that's not his own. So what would Jesus do? Offer himself once through his own blood. Uh, Hebrews 10, 11, and 12. It says, Every priest stands daily and offering time after time the same sacrifices. Remember, those priests would die, another generation of priests would come, they'd do the same thing to a new generation of Israelites, over and over, which can never take away sins. But he, in contrast, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. So notice, do you see in verse 11, the priest stands? What does Jesus do? He sat down. So that shows the priest's job was never done. 
when Christ sits down, it's showing it's done. He can sit down because the, the work is complete. And to add to this, Jesus' offering of himself was perfectly acceptable to God. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Really, the, the, it's really verse 2. But notice how he puts application and a mandate for the believer based on a truth about Jesus. So the mandate for us is be imitators of God. Now, that doesn't mean you can be God. You know that, right? You're not deity and you never will be. So we imitate God through character. And what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there's no law. So when we imitate God, we should be imitating Christ, and the fruits of the Spirit are really His character qualities. So be imitators of God. Does it say to become children of God? As children of God. So you're already children of God, so therefore walk a certain way. How, why do people have this backwards? They say you've got to walk a certain way to become a child of God, and then to keep your salvation, you've got to keep obeying and all of this. It's not what the text is saying. So as beloved children in Christ the Beloved, from Hebrews 1.7, we need to imitate God in our walk through the power of the Spirit. And then it even adds one of the fruits of the Spirit, and walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you, when did he do that? At the cross. And gave, past tense, gave himself up for us at the cross. And Now listen, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now a lot of people, if you haven't read the Old Testament, you're going, I don't even know what that means. What is this aroma? Fragrant aroma. Now obviously it's a good smell, right? Why? It's a good fragrance. I mean, we like things that smell good. We don't like things that stink, do we? And you know what? I think God even built odor into things for a reason. There's a reason things smell the way they do. And look how God uses these things about aroma. What, so the, well, let me, let me just go to a couple Old Testament passages to make my point. So it's a fragrant aroma, so it's something that smells good. Exodus 29, 18, this is where this comes from. It looks back to the Levitical sacrifices. Exodus, I'll give you two of them. One here, Exodus 29, 18, in the law, it says, you shall offer up in smoke the whole ram on the altar. So there's that brazen altar where they put the sacrifices. The priest would do this. And it's a burnt offering to the Lord. It's a what? Soothing aroma. So it smells good to the Lord. An offering by fire to the Lord. So let me ask you, what do you think a soothing aroma to God indicates? That it is acceptable. Thank you. I think that's what it's uh, trying to communicate. And remember, the animal sacrifices of the Levitical priests had to be tamim, the Hebrew word for perfect or without blemish. It's even used of human character. But when we're talking about animals, the animals aren't moral beings. They had to be without blemish, perfect in the sense of uh, no warts, no missing uh, hair, uh, eye defects, uh, warts. Anything on the animal makes it unacceptable. And if they were not acceptable and they had some blemish, they couldn't be used at all. What would God think then if they took a... a the, okay, remember in Leviticus 11, they're clean and unclean animals. Can you give me a clean animal? A ram. That was a clean animal. A lamb was, was clean. What was an unclean animal? Bacon. <laughs> yeah, a lot of animals were considered unclean for various reasons. Uh, lions. You could not eat lion. I don't think, uh, and you're like, why? Well, those were predators. You couldn't eat things that ate carrion. You couldn't eat things that ate dead things on the bottom of the ocean, like crab. See, it's teaching the Israelites something about death. You're not wrong to go to Red Lobster and have crab. 
We're not under that law anymore. Just read Acts when the tablecloth came down and God said to Peter, kill and eat everything unclean on that cloth. But they were, they were teaching aids to Israel. And some of the food laws, I'm still kind of scratching my head. Why exactly couldn't you eat that and you could eat this? Um, so if the animal was unclean, it's unacceptable. What would that smell like to God? What do you say, P-U? <laughs> nope, not acceptable. But what if it's a, a lamb that has broken bones? Doesn't smell right, no good, not acceptable. Another one here is in Leviticus 1, 8 and 9. The, then Aaron's sons, the priests, the Levitical priests, shall arrange the pieces, that would be the animal sacrifice, over the wood on which the fire on the altar and the entrails and the legs shall be washed with water. And the priest shall offer all of it, offer it up in smoke on the altar. It's a burnt offering, an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. Again, this goes on in Leviticus 1.13, 1.17, and 3.16. So when Paul talks about the aroma of Jesus Christ and his offering being acceptable to God, now we know where this is coming from. Because Jesus was not an animal. He was a man. He was the God-man. And he was perfect without blemish, without any sin, therefore qualified to be a, a sacrifice on the cross, not an actual burnt offering on an altar. And when he died on the cross and said, it is finished, what did God do? It smelled good to him, right? It was acceptable. That's the point of Ephesians 5. And I want to add an applicational point to this. Since the sacrifice of Christ was acceptable to God, what does that make you? as a believer in Christ, not an unbeliever, positionally acceptable. And I'm highlighting positionally because is our behavior after salvation always acceptable? No. But our position in Christ, perfectly acceptable. So listen to Romans 15, 17. In the applicational section of Romans, which is really um, starting in chapter 12, going through 15, 17, somewhere around there. He says to Christians, therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Now, let's look at that carefully. Do you see the word accept two times? You know, that's the same Greek word. All right, but what's the difference? You can see it in English. One's present, one's past. So I'm commanded to accept another Christian brother why? Because Christ has already accepted, past tense, accepted me. And when did he do that? The second I believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior, he saved me and made me one of the acceptable ones because I'm covered in the blood, if you will. A lot of non-Christians go, ooh, what does that mean? You're covered in blood? We know what that means. The sacrifice covers us. And now that he's made me acceptable to God, why shouldn't I accept my brother who's in his position, just as acceptable as I am. Behavior, maybe not. Uh, we're not. We're not always walking the same way with God, but aren't we all equally in Christ, all acceptable to God? Another reason why we should have harmony in the body. That doesn't mean we embrace everybody's actions. If they're not walking with God, you don't accept that behavior, but he's still a brother, Right? And the ultimate goal is restoration. Are we still in Hebrews? Let's go back to chapter 8. I know I sound like a broken record when I say, well, the next two verses are challenging. <laughs> As you go through Hebrews, you can say that all the way through the book. So he continues the argument, and I'm going to add some interpretive comments along the way here, and I pray to the Lord that this is correct. Now, if he, isn't that Jesus? Now, if he were on earth, which he's not, where is he? 
He's at the right hand of the Father. And this was written in the 60s AD, so he was already up at the right hand of the Father. So if he, Jesus, were on earth, which he's not, he would not be a priest at all since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. Now, what I think he's saying is, while Jesus was on earth at his first advent, the Levitical priests were still functioning under the law of Moses, right? And if Jesus were still on earth, then he wouldn't be functioning as high priest in the manner of Melchizedek while the Levitical priests of the Mosaic law are still in operation. You see his point? But he keeps on. So I'm going to read verse 4 and 5 together because it's one sentence here. So if, if Jesus were on earth, he would not be a priest at all since there are those who offer gifts according to the law. Who? Who's the who? In verse 5, the Levitical priests. Who, the Levitical priests, serve a copy and shadow of heavenly things. So they serve, the, the Levitical priests serve in an earthly tabernacle which was only a copy of the one in heaven, where Jesus is actually now functioning as high priest, just like it says in chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. So who, these priests, serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For he says, God says, see that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. What mountain is that? Mount Sinai. Remember in Exodus 19, they got to Mount Sinai and the mountain quaked. The people were in fear. Moses would go up to Mount Sinai to get the law. So you can see a lot of this um, in the book of Exodus, of course. Exodus 25, you can go all the way to 3118 and see the, the tabernacle and what the priests had to wear. And then uh, it says, all this was written to Moses on the tablets by the finger of God. Remember that? So God gave this directly to Moses. So Jesus could not function as our high priest in the manner of Melchizedek on earth while the Levitical priesthood was still functioning under the law of Moses. But now that the law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood have come to an end at the death of Christ on the cross, Jesus can now function as our high priest in the heavenly tabernacle at the right hand of God. I think that's his argument. Uh-oh, I got two scriptures up there. Going back to chapter 7. Hebrews 7.12, remember what he said? He's, he's contrasting the Levitical priesthood under the law of Moses with the high priesthood of Christ under the law of Christ. So in Hebrews 7, 12, in the middle of that argument, he says, For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. So what priesthood was changed? Which, from this one to the, what, which one? From the Levitical to the high priesthood of Jesus. What law was changed? The Mosaic, and I think into the law of Christ for the church, Galatians 6, 2. So something switched, isn't it? We have an administration or dispensational change. That's why I'm a dispensationalist. You see these things and something has changed in God's administration. The church is different than the law of Moses for the Israelites. It's a different administration. So I think the priesthood changed, because remember the priests are offering sacrifices? Well, when did Jesus act as our high priest? When he offered himself, because the Jews are, the Levitical priests are offering animal sacrifices. Jesus offered himself. Wouldn't that be functioning as a priest? And when he did that at the cross, of necessity there takes place a change of law. Um, look at, I uh, have below there, Matthew 27, 51. So if you read Matthew 27, you'll see the trial of Jesus and the crucifixion account. You can compare this in the other Gospels as well and pick up other things that happened through the other three Gospels outside of Matthew. 
But remember what Matthew 27, 51 records. After Jesus Christ breathed his last, remember he committed his spirit to the Lord? And behold, and he also said what according to John 19, 30 that's not revealed in Matthew? To tell us die, it is finished, done. Then he dismisses his spirit. So you got to go to all four gospels and put all this together and say, wow, these are all the things that happened at the cross. And what happened right after the crucifixion, after he dismissed his spirit? Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, from this way, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. God even created this supernatural earthquake. I wonder if there are any priests going, hmm, <laughs> what was that? So the splitting of the veil happened right after the crucifixion when Jesus gave up his spirit showing that access to God is no longer required through the Levitical priesthood once a year on the Day of Atonement. See, the priest would once a year on the 10th day of the 7th month take that sacrifice, that blood sacrifice, go behind that final veil in the Holy of Holies, which no one else could do. So what does it symbolize when that veil rips in two from top to bottom after the death of Christ? That... that Holy of Holies was representative of the one in heaven. So now what do we have access to? Through our high priest, God the Father. And do you, is it one day a year? No. I know Christians that say, I can't go to church except on Sunday and talk to God because the church isn't open till the seventh day on Sunday. Like, you can't go to God right now at home? And I was talking to somebody at a business she was working behind the desk when I was going to see my customer. And I said, no, 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 you can pray right now to him. You have access to God. You don't have to go to your church to do that. She was so, wow, really? <laughs> I'm like, who's been teaching you this stuff? Limiting your spiritual life. You remember Ephesians 2.18? For through him we both have our access by means of one spirit to the Father. That's in the church. So that, that is highly symbolic what happened in Matthew 27. And now we can go through, we have access to the Father through Him, Jesus, by means of one Spirit, which would be the Holy Spirit. So 24-7 can you approach God. And you don't have to go to a Levitical priest. You can go straight to the throne room of heaven to Jesus Christ, our high priest, at the right hand of God. Could you imagine believing that you can't approach God for maybe once a week? Somebody might try to argue it's only once a year. If you're still, if you're still under the law, then you might think that. Dr. Thomas Constable said this, God had explained the fact that the tabernacle was a prototype of another temple, the heavenly one, to Moses when God gave him the directions for the construction of the tabernacle. Moses may have received a vision of God's heavenly dwelling place at that time. He says you can compare 1 Chronicles 28, 19. He said the writer's point was that Jesus' priesthood was not an earthly priesthood, but one that operated in the realm of heaven. Um, you know, I got to thinking about this comment because remember in Exodus 25, 40, God said, you make that tabernacle exactly as you saw it on Mount Sinai. Wait a minute. So we're going to build something on earth that Moses saw on Mount Sinai? Was, that on, was the tabernacle on Mount Sinai? No, it was the one in heaven. So I don't think I'm going out on a limb here that God showed Moses a vision or somehow let him see that third heaven tabernacle and said, this is what you're going to have to build there. And was it perfect? Did it have to be according to... I mean, if it was... The curtains were to be of a certain color. Can you change the colors because you didn't like the color God picked? No, you had to do it exactly as he said. The ark had to be exactly the size God said, made of acacia wood overlaid with pure gold. Everything had to be according to specifications. And I think because this is the place God is going to meet his people and it needs to be orderly and according to his way. And now we are the tabernacle of God, right? The church is the temple of God. And we are individual members of that temple. And 
Can you meet God wherever you want? You can, when you're on your way home in your car, you can meet God because you take your little tabernacle with you. This is not the tabernacle. This is a church building. You can meet in the lean-to. It doesn't even have to have a roof, and it could still be a place to meet, right? I like our church. It's comfortable, and but some people have a lot more. Some people have a lot less. But a gathering can be in a home, right? They met in homes in the first century. Um, do they, does the roof... Are we godly because the roof is this? It doesn't matter. It can be flat. I think there is something about church architecture that does say something. Those big vaulted cathedral ceilings were to show the majesty of God. And then they got real flat to show fellowship. And sometimes we went just to fellowship and no God. Sometimes we go to God and no fellowship. Ours isn't so arched. Maybe we're in the middle, right? But I think there should be. I'm kidding. But there should be a balance there, right? Uh, we, as they say, you don't come to sit and soak and that's it. We come to learn t- so that we can apply the word to one another and then uh, to others outside of here, including the unbeliever. <clears throat> well, so far in the first five verses, the writer explained Jesus Christ's better ministry, which is superior in three respects. And I think I borrowed this from somebody. I don't know who it was. If they ever listen to me and say, you didn't give me credit, I give you credit, whoever you are. But number one, Jesus serves as a, uh, as a seated priest, having finished his work of offering a final sacrifice for sins, verse 1. Number two, he's, in th- he's an enthroned priest, having taken his place at the right hand of God the Father, verse 1. And he's a heavenly priest having entered the true sanctuary where he's now ministering. And his priesthood, I would add, has replaced the Levitical. From an earthly tabernacle to a heavenly one. So now we come to the new covenant. Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. Has everybody heard of the new covenant, at least heard of it? Okay. This is going to be our subject for at least the next month. And you can see how important it is because look at 8, 6 and following. The argument continues from the previous. And verse 6 says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. So Jesus has a more excellent ministry than the Levitical ministry. Hey, the Levitical ministry was good. His is better. By as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant. By the way, who is the inferior mediator of the Mosaic law? Moses. Now, I'm not downing Moses, but compared to Jesus, who's better? That was the argument of chapter 3. Jesus is superior to Moses. So he's also the mediator of a better covenant, the, the covenant that's So the mediator Moses and the old covenant of the law has something better, the mediator Jesus and the new covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, so the Mosaic covenant obviously wasn't, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, God, he says, God, Now watch what he does. He is going to quote Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 in its entirety. The central passage in the Old Testament on the new covenant. Notice he doesn't just say, quote half of it and just say, you know the rest. He quotes all of it. Behold, days are coming. Jeremiah 31, 31 says that. Says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the church. Do you see that? With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Those are the Jewish people. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. That was when they got the Mosaic covenant at Sinai. For they didn't continue in my covenant, the Mosaic law, and I didn't care for them, says the Lord. He didn't, so God doesn't care for people? What does that mean? Remember, he said, if you disobey me, 
I'm going to pull back my blessing, and I'm going to even let disaster come upon you. So he's just showing his disdain for them breaking his law. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. And I think this is future when Jesus comes back to rule on David's throne. I will put my law in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. Has this happened now? When you read what's going to happen in the new covenant and you see today it's not happening, not like it's supposed to, we're still waiting for it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, right now, is Israel God's people? Yes and no. Remember, when they're in covenant with God, they are in covenant with God, they are His people. But remember in the Scripture, when God ever says to Israel, you're not my people, what does that mean? They're His people, but they're in disobedience. I like the illustration and I keep using it. It's like a father who has a son. When his son hits a home run, that's my boy, comes back with a perfect report card, that's my son. But if the son messes up really bad, what does the father say? That's not my son. I don't know that kid. Something like that. I think that's what God's doing with Israel here. Of course they're his people. He says, I can never break that covenant. I made it with them and I must fulfill it with the Jewish people. But when they're in disobedience, they're called not my people. Remember the book of Hosea? I'm watching my time and I had a couple of minutes here. So remember the book of Hosea? Hosea was a prophet who had to marry Gomer. And what was Gomer? Not just a woman, but she was a what? She was a harlot. What God is saying is, my covenant people, my wife, Israel, is a harlot. She's playing the harlot with other gods. Uh, Isaiah 54 calls Israel a wife forsaken, though God was a husband. The new covenant even says, I was a husband to them, but they, they broke my covenant. So Israel plays the harlot. And so Hosea has to go take a harlot wife to show that illustration of how God has a harlot wife. And so Hosea restores her, doesn't he? And what does God do with the harlot Israel? He says, one day I'll tear up that certificate of divorce and restore you in the land, and again you will be my people. So covenant faithfulness will be restored. So I will be their God, they'll be my people, Hebrews 8, 11, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen... And everyone his brothers saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. Is that happening now? Look at Israel now. Do they all know God? No, this has not happened yet. Verse 12, for I will be merciful to their iniquities. So God's going to forgive their sins, as it says in the next line, and I'll remember their sins no more. Jeremiah 31, 34. And when he said in verse 13, when he said a new covenant... He has made the first obsolete mosaic, and whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. And this is where we will begin next time. So some good application and some difficult verses in our text today. And now we'll really look at one of the most important. All the covenants are like the foundation for history, the Abrahamic, the Davidic, the new covenant, they're so important to understand because they're the foundation of where everything's going in history and will all culminate in that new covenant in the kingdom when Jesus rules. So I want you to be so prepared that when you're there, you'll go, I know what this is. I I saw the brochure of where I was going. You know, I was looking at those brochures. I'm going to Hawaii. Look where I'm going. Well, hey, here's, here's my brochure, the Holy Bible. This is where I'm going. And I want to know where I'm going, and I want to study that. So let's look at that next time, and we'll start back right around verse 6 and start developing the the new covenant from the Old Testament, come all the way back, however long that takes, a couple hours, I don't know, and then we'll start back in the New Testament. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that we still have a place to meet where we can meet in safety and a quiet time together to worship you and learn about you. Because, Lord, when we go out there, uh, Satan's firebombs and darts come quick. And we need to have your word 
just ready for application, the sword of the Spirit ready to go to battle. And Lord, we don't even, we want to know it so well that we hardly think we just do it. So Lord, the more we know, the more, the more we can apply. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that indwells us, that gives us the, the power to do so. And may we do so to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very one we wait for, who will come to resurrect this church one day. And as he'll descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so shall we always be with you, Lord. And may we be comforted by these words. And may we be encouraged to fight the good fight until Jesus comes back for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.